Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Zoom Into Wine. It's time for the show and your host, Ian Blackburn. Well, I am happy to have you guys here. My name is Ian Blackburn, and I'm going to be hosting a Zoom tonight on Beaujolais for our program called Zoom Into Wine, uh, where we calendar classes every Wednesday night, and we're announcing live events um, on our website, Wine Cloud Inc., which is the mothership, uh, the mother storm, as we call it, for Learn About Wine and Wine LA and Stars of Wine and everything else that we have going on. Uh, so uh, every Wednesday we'll continue on Zooms, but uh, we'll and we'll see how the world uh, continues to progress or re regress potentially, and we'll see. Uh, we'll, but uh, we're going to keep this this platform going. I really like it. Um, I know uh, you've had some trouble getting uh, your delivery out there, buddy. Uh, sorry about that. I heard about it today. But uh, we will uh, continue to hope it arrives so you can taste these great wines. It looks like you got something else to drink. That's fine. Uh, Peter Work, thank you for joining us tonight. Love to hear from you. Hopefully you enjoy the wines. This is a really nice lineup. It's right up your alley. And uh, Satsuko, we're still working on figuring out how to send the wines to Japan via, um, we're gonna beam them up. That's how we're gonna do it. We're gonna figure that out. That'll be my contribution to mankind. Abel, I see you guys getting serious over there. Uh, hopefully you guys have the wines and are able to taste with us. We'd love to hear your comments. There's a chat box down here at the bottom. And for those of you that are watching, on Facebook, um, you can always email us or comment on Facebook and we'll respond to you immediately after the Zoom. These wines are available at merchantofwine.com and uh, some of them are less available <laughs> because we've had a very good Beaujolais moment here. Beaujolais, as I said, is booming and it's because I think a couple of factors. One, the wines have been great and they continue to improve what Beaujolais is. It used to be, uh, you know, a very celebrated wine if you go back far enough. Uh, in the 1950s, a great Beaujolais was the same price as a great Burgundy. Um, but gradually, with the uh, advent of Beaujolais Nouveau, the category got confused and it watered down the category and its reputation. And the collectability and the price point of Beaujolais people started to think of it as a lesser wine. And that was a good marketing uh, lesson for all of us in wine to see take place. Um, I really think that if you can apply that lesson to a lot of different wine categories and see that we continue to make that mistake over and over and over again. Um, Beaujolais today though is emerging from that fog and a, one thing is happening uh, that I, I'm basically just, this is all opinion by the way, but uh, I really think that the great Burgundy houses um, have, I mean, the, the, the fog is lifted on great Burgundy and prices have soared. And not a lot of the Burgundy producers have much to do with that. Uh, bur prices of Burgundies have soared because of demand. And the fact is that there just is no more Burgundy to plant. Uh, it is fully planted. They're operating at peak capacity and it is a product of mother nature and they are under uh, you know, incredible um, proud guidance to make the best wines and not the most wine that they can make. Now, Beaujolais had moments where it was making too much wine and the way you get rid of too much wine is you keep the price point super cheap and it kind of flooded the market. Um, categories like Nouveau, uh, uh, basic Beaujolais, that wasn't very good and uh, you know it's a recipe for destruction well here comes the latter days and uh, burgundy is booming and, and boomed and is now you know selling for astronomical sums you know bottles uh, single bottles of wine are selling for thousands of dollars in burgundy and it is uh, it is because of that upward direction and a lot of the Burgundians' involvement in Beaujolais. You look at houses like Jadot, uh, and they have uh, a property in Beaujolais, and, and many, many top 
producers in uh, Burgundy have planted their flag in Beaujolais as well. Even Loire it just came out with Gamay, uh, Bourgogne Gamay, uh, this year, first time ever. So I really think that the Beaujolais thing is starting to take off in a bigger and more meaningful way, but because the wines are getting better. More, more uh, quality, more isolation on old vine vineyards, more demand for better fruit, and the lesser fruit, I'm sure will continue to stay stagnant in its price point. It's a simple wine when it's made that way, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about really good efforts in Beaujolais, and that is really the category that I am focused on and see the future being very bright for. And I see prices increasing because the wine is better and, and customers are willing to pay for it when the wine gets better. And it is, it's still an insane value. The wines that we're gonna to taste today, I don't think any of them are north of $40. And these are just truly remarkable things I love to drink. And I will tell you, some of these wines today are gonna to be about power. And some of them are gonna surprise you. And, and some of them are a little bit more about finesse. And I really think that uh, you can take Beaujolais and kind of use your judgment on when you serve it and what you serve it with. Because I think these wines that we're going to taste today, while they're all really good and they're all Gamay and they're all beautiful Beaujolais, they have very different moments based on their price point, based on their own expectation. And uh, I think that's what's kind of cool about Beaujolais. It's kind of like shifting gears. You want to go fast or you want to go for a luxury drive or you want to go for a cruise. This wines will get you there. Uh, when I go out to a fancy meal, fancy dinner, or something like that, I, I, I'm not in the, I did not sell my tech stock at Highs and, and retire to some private island where I've got a cellar full of collectibles that I get to pull out and take to dinner. I say that like that because I'm thinking of one person in, in particular who posts on Facebook all the time these amazing wines that they open and uh, they made lots of money in in the markets and congratulations to them uh so what i have to do is i have to put my thinking cap on a little bit and come up with a wine that i can take out to a fancy restaurant that a the wine list probably doesn't have or b somebody in the group probably didn't think to bring a lot of people when they go out to dinner they take this sledgehammer type of cabernet out to dinner with them and when you go out to a great meal maybe a sledgehammer Cabernet isn't the best wine for the meal. And I think that's where Beaujolais is one of the great wines for a dinner. I, I'm talking like French laundry. Uh, I'm talking about Melisse. I'm talking about a really nice food experience where you, you know, you know, you're going to pay over a hundred dollars for the food and you know, you want to have a nice array of wines, but maybe you don't want to spend a thousand dollars on off the wine list for the wines. And I really think that Beaujolais is optimal for that type of cuisine. And it really allows the food to show off and it doesn't hammer the, the food with too much uh, content. So all of that, we got a booming category, better wines, better marketplace, lots of places to apply these wines and great price points for you to purchase them at. So let's get into the into our presentation. Peter, thanks for saying hi. Use the chat box, everybody. Chat it up and let's start drinking. As uh, I said, Peter says he's ready, ready and thirsty. So let's go. I'm going to start with wine number one, which is the Beaujolais Village from Alex Foyard. And I want to confess that uh, when I first purchased the Foyard, I ordered it from the importer Kermit Lynch. And uh, Foyard's got many different family members out there. And uh, so when Alex walked in the door, I was like, wait a second, I didn't order Alex, did I? And I looked at my product code that I sent in and sure enough, I ordered Alex. So I didn't even hesitate. I just said, it's gonna be great, let's try it out. I popped the bottle, I took a look, and here's our Alex Foyard. It is a 2019, 
which you know vintage is very uh, vintages have been crazy in Burgundy um, and we've had vintages that are big and vintages that are small but uh, most of them have been warm and most of them have really been able to allow Beaujolais to achieve something pretty pretty damn interesting and I don't know if there's been a bad Beaujolais vintage in the last decade I'm sure there's been some great ones and when Beaujolais when when it's been really hot like 2015 I thought the Beaujolais were so showy and interesting and really really cool so let me find my uh, my uh, slideshow and here it is I've got it there boom 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 A little geography Beaujolais southern part it's actually kind of connected to the Burgundy area but for tax purposes it's actually in the Rhone uh, so I'm not sure we'll have to talk business someday with the Beaujolais producers but uh, they they pay um, basically the Cote de Rhone uh, uh, people for the Beaujolais efforts the marketing dollars maybe that's changed but that's how it's it's still segregated on the internet So when we look at Beaujolais specifically, we've got 10 villages, really good survey question. We sometimes play some games, go around the table, um, ask a bunch of really geeky wine people, can you name all 10 villages in Beaujolais? And uh, you know, the way to view it is kind of thinking about it from the south to the north. So you get both of the breweries, the brewery and the Cote de Brewery, Renier, Morgon, Chirouble, Fleury, Moulin Avant, Chenas, Genas, Asanamor. Uh, Julianas, sorry, I said uh, Chenas and Chenas twice. Uh, Julianas, Chenas, Sanamor. Um, these are the crews of Beaujolais. When a wine says Beaujolais, it's probably not made from the crews. It's made down here in. Uh, oh, annotate didn't work. Hold on. There we go right down here in the flatlands where you can get large yields and they make you know cheap wines that uh, they use carbonic and they get just buku amounts of wines these are hills up here these are villages these are older vines uh, the, the, there's no machine you can use to harvest or do any of the work because the hills are too steep it's all handwork and it's a totally different category. And maybe a really smart person someday will, will really distinguish the crews of Beaujolais away from Beaujolais even more uh, and really almost consider it two different wine categories. I think within the, the academics, uh, we've already done that. And it's just, um, I think the plain boring Beaujolais or Beaujolais Nouveau really needs to be hyper separated. Now there's some tremendous history here goes back to um, in uh, first century before Christ and really that's when the Romans came and planted vines in France uh, about 24 2500 years ago uh, vineyards started being uh, appearing in France of course you had Charlemagne around 700 um, you get up into a little bit further and you got this guy Philip the Bold um, really an important figure 1395 he outlawed Gamay from Burgundy that's a pretty important uh, date in the in the line about Beaujolais Philip the Bold had some pretty awful opinions about Beaujolais and he wanted to really keep his Pinot Noir pure and his influence on the region is intense big and uh, and a lot of interesting things were used there the monks were making the wines by this time and the monks were making some interesting wines and Burgundy had a reputation and they wanted to further that reputation and they were they were really kind of courting the royals in Paris and other places and trying to get people to think of boat as Burgundy as the greatest wine in France and that was kind of the competition that all the regions had now, Gamay itself comes from kind of a uh, cross of Pinot Noir 
and a grape called Goyas, G-O-U-A-I-S. I said Goyas, I'm not sure how else to pronounce that. Someone else can correct me. If you speak French, please do. I always welcome that. Um, but uh, the latter, a Central European variety that is probably introduced to northeastern France by the Romans. So whether it was Gamay and Pinot Noir at the same time and somebody did it in France or later, I've even heard other stories where maybe it was given to the, the French by the Germans. I, 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 I really think it depends on who you uh, prefer to listen to and the, there's quite a bit of um, uh, dispute about where Beaujolais came from but because uh, Philip the Bold banished it to Beaujolais, um, it, there, there, there's a little bit of uh, some stories about why he did that. Okay, so we get down into Beaujolais, we look at the individual crews once again, and we see them here. We're gonna taste in a particular order. We're starting off with our Beaujolais Village, which is a collection of uh, this higher uh, ground or hillside areas and can be both a uh, declassified village, crew village, or this area down here. So uh, it's kind of a combination. Anything in this purple zone, I guess, could also be used to make a Beaujolais village because it's not in greater, simpler, flatter Beaujolais area. And here's our first bottling, Alex Foyard. This is uh, Jean Foyard's son, and uh, there are many different Foyards to appreciate, uh, and they're certainly one of the brands to trust. Um, this is made to have an exceptional price, um, and it is 70 year old, yeah, 70 year old vines, 70 year old, come on, uh, limestone and sand, so not as, uh, as drastic, not as uh, rocky, as some of the other uh, villages uh, that we're gonna taste today. And I think it shows that. When I put the wine in my glass and I swirl it around, I get this really pure, clean, and you cannot be a sand, that makes sense, because there's nothing granitic, there's nothing um, uh, metallic, there's very little uh, terroir pronunciation it's elegant and it's and it's uh, when you say sand you put your nose in the glass and you smell it you can really understand okay that makes sense sand now for those of you that maybe don't taste that often uh, one day I got to go to a tasting in Germany to learn about Riesling um, a really prestigious co uh, school there and they poured me 100 German Rieslings to taste in a row in quick succession. And by the time you got through 100, my, your mouth is not only sore, but you could really tell if it was planted in sand or planted in slate. And it was absolutely um, obvious. Now, uh, wine science hasn't quite agreed on how or why that happens. It would make sense. The vine's planted in the database of information that it's pulling it into the grape variety. But what science is maybe saying is that maybe it's not the process of the vine implanting it into the, the berry, but the yeast that's out in the vineyards. I just don't buy that yet. And uh, Peter, I'd love to hear what you think since you're so connected to it uh, and a wine, great winemaker in Santa Rita Hills. But uh, I think we just haven't figured out how uh, the vine is really me metabolizing that information and downloading it into the, basically the, uh, the hard drive known as a grape. And uh, I, that's why I think of it. And uh, so this wine smells like it was grown in sand and limestone. Um, all the farming and, and Beaujolais is a very organic uh, growing appellation they're pushing, you know, all of France, all of the old world is really pushing the, uh, the, their viticulture practices towards either organic or biodynamic or sustainable. Here's a picture, Jean or Jean Fayard on the left, dad, 
and the son, Alex, on the right. Oh, clicks past it. Another shot. There's a younger version. And here's a, 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 a really nice picture of the hills. Really pretty cool. Um, this would be probably November. Uh, and the harvest has already taken place. And it's beautiful there at that time. And uh, that is our shot. Now I want to taste this with you guys and get some feedback. Anyone that's got the wine, love to hear your impression. This is a lighter, softer wine. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna exit the slideshow for a second. I'm gonna pull up uh, the website so we can talk about it fairly on price. Don't everybody speak at once, but I welcome you to. $31 uh, for this particular Beaujolais Village. When I smell this wine, I get, um, a, a, certainly you can tell that they're not going for overripe here. This is a wine that's picked in a youthful state. There's some really interesting fruit perfume there's really interesting uh, combination of spices. I get this really interesting kind of um, a tomato thing that I wouldn't nor normally think of uh, with Beaujolais. A lot of people are using uh, different winemaking techniques. Um, I'm sure the dad has influenced his son here with some um, really nice um, winemaking styling. Slightly on the vegetative end, which is pretty. And it gives it complexity because it's not overly vegetative. So in the note here, you can see that it's beneath the crew of Rene. Let's go back into our uh, Zoom into Wine um, uh, document and see where that's at. Right in here. So it could be over here, it could be over here. Um, I think it's quite lovely, elegant. Um, you can tell, unfined, unfiltered, a little uh, natural. Uh, probably did a little bit of stem inclusion, and that's what's giving it that little bit of vegetative element there. I think I, I'm, I'm, I bet you there's 10% stem and they're using, uh, I, I doubt they're using carbonic on this wine. I think they're using uh, just very Burgundian approaches. And the more I, I drink that wine, the more I really like it. I definitely think it takes a little bit of a, a Beaujolais um, nerd to love this wine, but I, I think it's awesome. Smooth and soft for a Gamay, great balance, acidity, raspberries, light oak, if so. Yeah, I agree with you, Peter. Um, I, I definitely, when you go to the cellars in, in Beaujolais, they're using large wood uprights, um, some of them quite old. Uh, Definitely when we get into some of the other wines that we're gonna to taste tonight, you're gonna to see more influence from the smaller Coopers and stuff. But uh, this wine, I don't believe has that much wood influence, but it has some. I think more of the wood influence coming from the stem. And uh, I, I think that's what I'm getting a little bit there. It's just a, a kiss of that kind of winemaking. Um, unfined, unfiltered, um, uh, you know, 
probably soft pump overs and uh, really a gentle extraction. That's why the color isn't that dark. Didn't allow it to get too hot. Uh, didn't even allow for too much skin contact um, or stem um, contact as well. But I think stem may have helped uh, lose some of that color because that's what stem can do. It can knock the color down a little bit. It's kind of bottle you open up with uh, with dinner. And uh, Peter, um, as we go through these wines, we'll, we'll explore them. But honestly, I don't think there's any carbonic in any of the wines that we're gonna be tasting tonight. Uh, it's much more common in the bigger houses with the bigger production wines. These are all pretty artisan. And I know at Jado they don't use any carbonic on their crews. They're the, pro they're the largest producer uh, here and uh, they, they use carbonic on their simpler Beau, Beaujolais, but um, that is uh, just to help that fruit get maximize its expression. Uh, on the better, better wines, they make them in different facilities, etc. We'll talk about those in a little bit more. All right, let's go to our wine number two. Um, this is a wine that I was turned on to at the French Laundry. Um, I was looking for a, a Magnum bottle on the list that I could um, entertain our table with. We, we do trips to the Napa Valley and our final night is kind of a optional dinner at the French Laundry. It's limited to, to 10 guests. I think we pull it off with eight. They got a private room there that allowed us to do that. I think the new French Laundry has multiple private rooms now. But uh, the sommelier had some magnums of, of this particular wine in the cellar, and I was just like, awesome, let's do it. So uh, Claude Joffre is the producer here. Average vine age is 50 years old. Now here, when we get into Brewy, we're talking about uh, older village, and we got blue volcanic rock com composed of plagioclase and bio tile i don't know uh, bio deet. i don't know what that is but uh it sounds sounds like a rock to me and um it is organic matter um everything that they do here this is what the Beaujolais looks like another very cool fun thing i did once is we went uh bicycle riding uh up and down these hills and I think the point was to teach people how hilly Beaujolais was, but uh, it was doable and really fun. And we stopped a lot and we drank a lot on the bike. Um, here's a, a look at the family. Cote de Bruy is where we're at. Vineyards are situated on steep slopes with 48% grade. That's, that's pretty, uh, pretty steep. Um, and exposed to the south, east, and southeast. Fermentations last six to 12 days, aged in oak food ray uh, for six months before bottling, drinks well in its youth, and develops beautifully for three to eight years of uh, after vintage. Picture of Mr. Joffre. and the next generation. Multiple family members here. Lots of um, travel with these guys and they're working in Switzerland. They're working in, you noticed on uh, the other the other son. Uh, he's got a little Switzerland, Centimillion. Uh, Austria. Wow, oh, he even made wine in Colorado. Marlboro, New Zealand. So the families come together. They're making this wine off these older vineyards. They have about 8.3 hectares. Eh, probably pretty close to 20 acres. Uh, you're looking at, again, that rocky soil, older vines. 
and we're looking at the 2018 vintage it's a nice heat and uh, 18 is a, a great one here just as you smell the wine look at these stones and try to smell uh, you know this this is the the, the schist <laughs> And that's, that's exactly what you can pull off the top note of this wine, is that that uh, schist kind of a character, that rock. It's just right there. And then you, a typical Beaujolais, kind of cranberry, um, a swath of spices, potpourri, is often the description that somebody will use. Uh, lots of uh, natural farming processes. That includes a lot of the use of animals. Of course, they come through, eat the grasses, deposit some fertilizer. It's a really natural thing to do. Fattens those animals up. And uh, just to, to remind you of where we were before with this, this wine, I'll go back to the beginning here. And uh, yeah, we are right here in the Cote de Bruy, inside of Bruy, that hillside. Really cool. Yeah, I agree with you, Peter. Peter says a little reduction, more racy and sharp, better for aging, higher acid, more depth and body, more serious. Reminds me a little of the spices in Santenay. I totally love that. Yeah, um, I think so too. It's got a very Burgundian type of winemaking here too. You can tell no uh, uh, carbonic. Now carbonic maceration it's basically uh, leaving the whole berry. Uh, they get some fermentations going inside the berry. They uh, cover the top of the tank, stainless steel tank, almost pressurizing the fermentation. Um, and it intensifies the pressure of the fermentation and bursts the berry, releasing all of this uh, amazingly fresh fruitiness um, but a byproduct of that winemaking style can be smells like banana, and uh, that is not present in the wines that we're tasting tonight. I like your comment about the Santenae, as it's recent. Um, and it's um, softer like Santenae. Uh, we just had um, Philippe Cologne on a Zoom uh, last week, and we were tasting Santenay with him. And uh, that's, I, I think it's a really interesting parallel. There's a, a, an ease of access in Santenay. There's also an ease of access here as well. Really a little more generous. Um, I don't think the wine has the same stem inclusion uh, there may be some, uh, but I think it's a little more focus on fruit and that stony minerality and those old vines, uh, lower uh, yields and uh, a little bit more uh, depth of color uh, because of that hillside and, uh, and potentially the, t the time spent with skins and the extraction style. Also, 18, maybe helped out a little bit more, a little hotter, not quite as much rain. Uh, you might think I have to quickly go through this again, get to the end, get to our wine number three. Okay, wine number three. Oh, I didn't mention aging. Oh, uh, in the slideshow, this wine said best between I think three to eight years. Uh, I definitely 
think this wine in the first year of its release is a little uh, less uh, enjoyable than it is right now. I've had this in the cellar here for just about a year and it's, uh, I tasted it when we first when it first arrived. I tend to buy these wines about five cases at a time um, and I think I'm into our last case. Um, but the first case I had was a little green and youthful and it needed this year to really come around and I think by next year this time this wine will be spectacular. It's already on its way. It's nice, pretty, got that softness that, and that youthful underripe edge has gone away and that's what I remember about this house. This house has that kind of let it get a couple years old. By the way, the magnum that I had of this one at French Laundry was like five, six years old. So it was just spectacular. And by the way, Be Beaujolais is another one of those wines that if you can pick them up in a magnum, you can walk into a fantastic restaurant. Four of you are going to have dinner. Magnum is what you should be drinking. And a magnum of Beaujolais, which I don't even own any because I, I can't, they're really tough to sell. But I'm telling you, if you can find them, they're just awesome to have. I'll, I'll probably pick up some Magnums this year, um, trying to take the market, our website up, up market up a little bit. And since I love Beaujolais so much, I got to have some Magnums. But you can buy a Magnum for like 60, 70 bucks of great Beaujolais, maybe, maybe 90 bucks for the top houses. $90 for a magnum of great wine, that's that's a steal. That's a steal. And when you go out to dinner, you're going to see why a magnum was the right choice. It's about two glasses of each of the wine. It's perfect for four people. And if you love somebody, take a magnum to lunch. That's four glasses each. It'll be the best lunch you've ever had. Highly recommended. We move into Louis Jadot, wine number three, Chateau de Jacques. Now, I am uh, always always want to tell people the reason that that uh, thing sits behind me is I worked with Jadot for a long time and uh, I have been to Chateau de Jacques unfortunately a terrible hard drive incident years ago took away all my great pictures but um, I uh, I still have some somewhere but um, at Chateau de Jacques I got to see this amazing facility it was one of the great acquisitions that Jado made uh, maybe 15 years ago and uh, maybe even 20 years ago now just stole it it was a it's a treasured property great vineyard holdings this wine is actually a blend of eight single vineyards and they do make the the single vineyard versions of Chateau de Jacques which I love and adore they get a little more expensive about double um, uh, uh, Clos de Carcolin, uh, the Roche, and other things like that that you could find all these single vineyards. Small amounts make it to America, like less than 100 cases make it to all of America of these wines. But Chateau de Jacques it can be made in a pretty good sized volume. Um, and uh, I've, I've personally, uh, we go through this wine so fast, it blows through because the price value here is crazy great. Um, we'll get to that in a second. But Moulin Levant literally translates to, uh, you know, the town with a windmill there. Um, and it's a very recognizable spot. So there's so many good Beaujolais coming out of Moulin Levant. It's arguable uh, if it's Morgon or Moulin Levant that has the best of the best. And Jadot bought the top producer, top house, and top properties. Oh, there you go, 1996, so 25 years ago. Um, a pretty awesome time to make that type of acquisition. Here is the winemaker, um, and I've been able to Zoom with him. Really nice man, and uh, has been with Jadot for a while. Been working with Frederic Beignet, also Jacques Lardier, uh, the winemaking team, the head of winemaking there. see uh, some notes coming in from Peter you can post those to ever, for everybody to see Peter your notes are good um, 
Of the 10 crews of Beaujolais, both Moulin Levant and Morbon are considered distinctive due to their message in front of this there there we go do their soil the soil in Milan of is rich in iron and magnese manganese or magnesium uh, which seems to give the wines particular rigidity and youth and an uh, uh, a ability to age for decades and that is impressive right there who would ever think of Beaujolais aging for decades and I love aging these 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 Moulin Avant wines. They're really really spectacular. They age very slowly, and it blows people's minds to open up an 09 or a 12. That's what I have very little of now. But uh, let's see how our 2017 is doing. Now 17 uh, was another hot vintage, particularly hot, and it made some pretty exciting wine. One of the things we always did at Jeddo is we'd sit down with a sommelier and we would pour Chateau de Jacques uh, from uh, Gervais Chambertin next to a glass of Chateau de Jacques and see what they thought. And we wouldn't tell them what we were doing and we'd ask them and they would wonder what, what vineyard, what burgundy this is. And it's not Pinot Noir, it's Gamay. And very, very, I, I don't think anybody ever figured it out, actually. P people were always thinking this was Pinot Noir. And that's what is, uh, you know, that the soil, those rocky minerality accents. Just elevate this wine, and give it something a little bit more oomph. And in 17, they did have those, those, the heat and, uh, and they also had uh, some pr pr tough rain uh, events and things and they had some challenges with the weather. So they took all of the crews and blended them into the Chateau de Jacques 17. I remember this now. Um, so there are no, uh, well, there might be some, but there's less of the great single vineyards in 17 because they put them all into this wine. Um, and they made something a little bit more, with a little more stuffing because they need, you know, the House of Jadot is sold all over the U.S. and they need to have enough wine. Those single clothes, uh, they spoon out to small collectors and stuff like that. And they're going to be the most understanding. And uh, they're going to be very happy to be able to buy the Chateau de Jacques from Jadot for a very good price. Let's take a look at what that one sells for. Uh, I'll go to Jeddo. I think I skipped the brewery. So this wine's at $26.49. And I will say that <clears throat> this is crazy pricing because Jeddo uses their economies of scale and their sales force and their production size to be able to come in at a price like that. Um, this is the target price, but uh, I'm taking advantage of their aggressive discount that they offer the retailers and I'm passing it on to you. So I would highly encourage you to jump all over as any of these, uh, but know that I, mar I work very thin on our wines uh, and, and you can shop around and see that we're pro if we're not the lowest price in LA, we're, we're, you can see us on the same page. Let's just put it that way. Um, the Thieven wine at $30. Most everybody else is either sold out of it and they sold it for more than I do. I, I've got a smaller audience. I'm not a really well-known retailer. I'm not, I don't have a store that you can come to buying it online. And so uh, we have to work a little harder and work a little thinner to get some volume going. But $30 for this bottle. Uh, and by the way, this is now being sold in the 19 vintage. As I said, I buy them five at a time. If it takes two years to sell five, then it does. If it takes two weeks, then I probably go back to the well again and see if there's more. But sometimes you go back to the well and these are all gone. So they come in and they blow out pretty quickly um, with the exception of the Jetto because they make so much more. And But that's because they have the ability to make a lot more and they have great vineyards and a great team. I think it's a great wine. I think it competes with the smaller artists and uh, I'm a little biased as I said.
All right, let's move on to our last house, Daniel Boland. I'll start by showing you that this is uh, in the higher tier. Should be even more expensive because this is gone, gone. And I'm down to my last couple of bottles. Um, this is not uh, yet as famous of a producer as some of the others that we've had, but this is well on its way. The press for this producer has been tremendous and it's been year after year. And you're gonna, you're about to taste this wine number four. And uh, let's see if I can get that PowerPoint back open for us. And we can go into that. Peter, I see some chat activity from you. Let me not ignore that. Hold on a second. Yes, um, 18 as a vintage is m a much better overall quality vintage in Beaujolais. Uh, 17, they had to make some tough choices to make good wine. They put all their top wines into the basic wine to be able to get there. 17, or 18 allowed them to do it all. 18 is a giant vintage in, Beauj in, in all of Burgundy as well. And that was also nice because 17 was small, uh, 15 was small, 14 was small. There were a lot of successive small vintages. 18 allowed them to kind of rebuild and restock. Um, with the 17 Milan of Om being, you know, not quite as, as impressive of a vintage, got marked down a little bit, uh, only 92 points, I think I saw. Um, some of these Milan of Ons from Jadot get like 95 to, 90, to 98 points. Um, so, you know, it was a tougher vintage. The scoring reflected that. We're moving into the 18. More gold now, and you can see somebody going for it full throttle with this wine. This is uh, this is big time stuff, and this is not made uh, with the same intention as a lot of other Beaujolais. Here, here we are, Morgon, and we're talking about old vines, Vievine on the label, Corselet, Vievine from Daniel Bouland. And uh, I've, I've really enjoyed these, uh, the wines that I've had from this producer. I'll continue to support uh, 60 to 80 year old vines, granite, uh, seven hectares, that's all they really own. You know, the house of Jado probably has a hundred hectares of vineyard just in, just in the one property at moulin -Vin. So just to show you um, the, really an important uh, little producer here of merit and they have some really important vineyards in very important places in Morgon. Classic, classic all the way, even the label. Check out the vint, look at those vines in the background, come on. Crazy stuff. Parker says it's one of his favorite producers. You know you're gonna have somebody that's gonna make something just glass stainingly dark can you see how dark that is that's a that's Beaujolais it's not Syrah it's super magnified and uh let's see what else he says uh working with almost seven hectares predominantly very old vines of Morgon, Chirouble and Cote de Bruy, Boulogne vinifies with whole bunches so there's your stem inclusion pumping over twice a day and gives his wine a classic maceration of two to three weeks after pressing élevage in the foudre and cement tank con uh, concentrated and succulent boulons wines are beautiful differentiated differentiated by sight and age gracefully 2011s from my own cellar are still drinking beautifully boulon proudly informed me that he's now using higher quality corks so that graceful evolution should even be more so going forward he prefers 18 to 2017 finding the tannins finer uh, though i like both vintages about equally that was parker himself morgon uh, peter says most perfume knows and this wine, uh, Peter, I'll tell you, uh, yeah, there's a pretty good amount of wood here as well. Um, this wine does take a little extra time to come around. 
I have had uh, the same five cases for a while. I'm down to bottles here. I almost didn't make it to tonight. Um, when we put this program together a couple of months ago, I had a couple of cases and somebody grabbed a whole case for me because this producer is now selling 19s um, and 18s were so revered. 19s also got huge scores. Go to Parker, look up this producer, look what they got in 19s, big scores. This wine's got like a totally defi different definition. It's like lavender, purple, uh, dark. You got stewed meats. You've got uh, this uh, just punctuated fruit that the, the fruit, uh, if you got cranberry with the other fruits, you're almost like craisin here, like cranberry raisins. But it's not overripe. It's not that, uh, it's not figgy or um, uh, pruney. Um, it's just really concentrated. I almost get like a, a blood sausage kind of character in the nose. Like, I think it's called Boudot, right? Really um, savory, purple, just delicious. And uh, um, I think it represents the color that's in the glass. These are awesome Beaujolais. They are a great deal. Um, I think I showed you all of them on the website. You can find them easily uh, here. If you got the email tonight um, and you want to take advantage uh, as a, a person who's participating tonight, the email shows you the code. And I'm not going to say it out loud because I only have a little bit left. Some Somebody already jumped on some of it. But this wine right here um, was 26 now 1995 and those of you on the zoom tonight got a nine dollar 95 cent discount to buy some of this 14. it's a very pretty brewy um it is that makes the wine ten dollars a bottle if you want some there's only a couple bottles left um all of our wines tonight assort ten dollar ten percent off when you get to 12 bottles and i have a, this is just my beaujolais selection it's about, I'm about to go in and buy a lot of different Beaujolais to even further enhance this page. Um, but I have some really awesome smaller producers and some of my older vintages have been pecked off. Uh, I still have a couple, but these are uh, really, really great times to put some of these in your cellar and stock up on them. Um, this producer here, I get, I get bottles a year of Marcel Lapierre, uh, literally nine bottles of one. And uh, this one here, I think I got five. Um, that's when you're a new retailer, they start breaking you in with those type of allocations. And over time, you build up your, your chance to buy those. Some of these I could go and buy as many as I want. But uh, that when you get a reputation wine, like Marcel Lapierre, they get sold out in a day. Um, every winery wishes they had that problem. Uh, Jean-Paul Brun, one of my favorite producers of all time. Um, so uh, you'll see more producers coming in in our Beaujolais department. Maybe even some mags will appear. But uh, it'll probably be by the end of summer. I'll have a new fresh stocks because the, the wines are just arriving right now. And uh, there'll be the 19 vintages. I do recommend buying them if you like them. Put them in your cellar for a couple of years. They age beautifully. Right now, I'd love to be drinking 14 and 15s. Um, they are particularly awesome. Uh, 15 right now is magnificent, by the way. Any 15s that you can find. I do have a few more Beaujolais on here. Uh, here's some of my older ones. And then the Burgundies. So uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Any questions? I'd uh, love to chat with you. I'll stick around here and open it up to you. Peter, you just bought all the la those last bottles. That's great. <laughs> I'm glad Rebecca liked the wine. She does. She loves the wine. So can I throw in a little story about uh, Camille and, and uh, Bouchelet? Yeah, you don't please. mind? Love it. 
So, you know, I don't know if you know, Ian, but about uh, five years ago, I started a little joint project with Alex Gambell, who happens to be a American in Burgundy, working with a Dane in California. We thought that would be kind of cool. So I was over spending time with Alex in his house over in Santa Bank. And I was talking about, you know, how it was with Gamay. I was, I, for years, sorry if Rebecca's making noise in the back, for years, Gamay has not been my favorite. And I was telling Alex about it. And I don't know if you met, met Alex, he's just a I big wine. With him. Years ago, I tasted with him in, in, in Bone. In Bone, yeah. So, I mean, he's just a geek and has like a 5,000 bottle collection in Santa Bank. And he said, okay, give Gamay a chance. And he, pulled out, I think it was a 1973 Molang Rang, and it totally changed my perspective on Gamay because it is just a really a ageable wine. Gamay ages so darn well. And I would say it just blew my socks off because so many of us have tried all this Bouchelet in the world, carbonic maceration that they raise from, you know, uh, to the center of Paris as far, fast as they can get it. And it doesn't give you know, the right credit to the great um, Gamay. And therefore, I, I really enjoyed, together with Rebecca here tonight, just tasting through this great lineup. So, Ian, as always, thank you so much for what you're doing here. It's great. Oh, thank you so much, sir. That was so great. I'm, I'm glad. And I, I love Alex Gamble's wines, too. He's a, It's great to have an American in, in, in Burgundy uh, uh, making a name for himself and making some beautiful wines. And uh, are, so did you start potentially making Beaujolais? Is that where you're going? No, we have, we have, we've not gotten there yet. We have this thing in our family that if it wasn't for me, Ampelos would not have started. If it wasn't for Rebecca, we would have been bankrupt five times already. So okay. so she's always the one, if I had crazy ideas, she's like, no, we can't do that. No, we can't she do this. So we're, them we're, <laughs> yeah, so, so far we are staking to Pinot Noir. Syrah because she likes Syrah, Grenache, a little bit of uni and Rosé, but no Gamay yet. Let's see what happens. I bet you there's some Gamay getting planted in Santa Rita Hills right now, though. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, or Dan Kessler just pulled out, uh, I think, an acre or two acres of Pinot Noir and just replanted it or grafted it over to uh, Gamay here just a few months ago. That says so something. It's going to happen. That says something amazing. Yeah, because, uh, exactly. He's got a very... But, uh, but, uh, but, but our CFO here in the back is saying a no and she's shaking her head. So it's not <laughs> going to happen at any point. Well, you know, he'll pull that out, he'll plant that, and he'll have a hard time selling it for the same price as you can sell Pinot Noir for. <laughs> you, can't, you can't make $50 bottles of Beaujolais in Santa Rita Hills. Um, oh, yes. And, and that's, that's always been the challenge for this grape, right? You know, the, the great... California story of, of bankruptcy with Beaujolais is Charles Shaw himself, uh, the dentist from the 1970s, had uh, his fortune in Gamay in the Napa Valley and uh, went bankrupt. Winemaker uh, left and went away with uh, his wife and uh, left poor Charles Shaw with a bunch of Beaujolais he couldn't sell. Um, right. And that, that's, would have. that's the ultimate story of Beaujolais in California. But the um, but the uh, the grape variety I think is uh, is having a re renaissance and uh, we're seeing some artistic uh, renditions uh, appearing. I see quite a bit of Beaujolais appearing up in Oregon. I see, uh, and I'm talking about Gamay. I shouldn't say Beaujolais. I'm talking about Gamay the grape. Um, they'll call it Gamay. Uh, there's other wine. Um, personalities that are making gamay like wines um, and I've seen those in, throughout California in small productions but I, I, I think Beaujolais the real thing is still having a, a great moment and uh, the vintages are helping they're making exciting wines and the fact that the big importers are now behind them and looking and supporting the smaller guys that don't have a lot of wine to sell um, and they're having success. It's just a uh, one thing compounds over another, and it creates momentum. And uh, this is this is why we, we're seeing so much good stuff coming into the marketplace. So really fun. Um, can we buy what we tasted today? Yes, you can. 
go to zoom into wine um, and you'll be able to click right through all of those wines are available on the website if you go uh, right into where you bought the event and you just go right down this will help you get there and you'll find it and you can just add it to your cart and go back and get the other wines keep adding them into the cart click open, open the cart and we'll get them out to you um, or you if you want to look at all the different Beaujolais you can use the search bar put in type in Beaujolais and uh, up pops everything that we've got and uh, You'll be, you, can, uh, you can even find the wines that we tasted today in, uh, using that search. Uh, we offer 10% off on any 12 bottles. We have a free shipping program here in Los Angeles on orders over $100, but it's only $10 to ship anywhere in California, and that is one hell of a good deal. If you prefer UPS now, we have a $20 flat rate um, negotiated for uh, orders in California with UPS. I know Peter, you prefer UPS and we have that kind of with you in mind, a $20 flat rate instead of paying GLS just buy UPS. If you don't like you, uh, GLS, that's a good choice. Uh, our gentleman on our Zoom tonight still is waiting for his wine that he ordered and it should have delivered on Wednesday. And it is uh, now, uh, I should have delivered, ye delivered yesterday, Wednesday. It's now Thursday night. He still hasn't gotten it yet, so we'll we'll he'll taste these wines later. Barbara, of all the yes. bottles that you have shown us tonight, uh, outside of the four, if you had to pick one uh -oh. to recommend us to purchase, what would that be? Uh oh. Let's see. Some of them, I will tell you, I only have bottles left. Um, I keep looking at this 14 Jean-Paul Brune. I, you cannot go wrong with this producer. Um, and, and you get to see something with a little bit more age on it. And it's a great wine. Uh, these wines don't sell for very much when they're first released, but he is a great producer and, uh, they they should elevate even further but they don't you're you know forty dollars pretty much the top of the chain for him at this time um i really love jean-marc burgard as well this morgon cote de gosh what vintage is that it doesn't even say oh that's because i have two vintages available i have the 11. oh look at that that looks like that looks like the wine right there the 11. This is Old Vine Cote de Pie 2011. Um, there's only a couple of those, and there's only a couple of those, so uh, 14. So those 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 are going to be my my go-to. Um, I love those producers. Um, he changed his label um, and put it into this style here, a little bit more artistic label. Um, these are lovely as well, but this one right here pretty special that's that's gonna be cool you won't put yeah you know what honestly though if you bought any of these these special bottles from us they're all they're all something I would I would stand up and dance for and I've taken all these out to great dinners so uh, don't 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 hesitate any of them that you can get your hands on you'll will make you happy um, Another good value that we have is this little $15 bottle from the Chablis producer, Renard. Um, it's a Fleury though, and Fleury is very light and very pretty, but this wine is aging wonderfully. It's a 16, really in good shape. The price point, it's a total bargain, and that's why it's on the website. I hope you guys had a good time. Thank you for joining me tonight. I look forward to tasting with you soon. Join us at Zoom Into Wine and check out all of our activities and uh, Wine Cloud Inc. And if anybody wants to go to Piedmont, I think I have one spot, maybe a couple, but uh, like one person or two uh, could go with us to Piedmont, Italy. We're going to be trying to close that by August 1st. And then we've got until the end of October 
so that you can get your money back if if there's a problem uh, we've been negotiating with our travel partners there if you want to go to Italy we're going in the end of November first week of uh, December all the information's on the uh, what website Merchant of Wine we've got a really I'm sorry it's all on the website uh, Wine Cloud Inc we got a really amazing group of people going with me so check that out um, uh, we're optimistic but we're also realistic and we've put everything in place uh, to protect everybody on the trip as best we can there will be a day where we have to step into the unknown and we'll have an insurance product uh, that'll help us if uh, something bad happens but uh, we're trying to go forward and we hope you will join us Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.